Hello and welcome to episode five of the Black Sheep Knitter podcast. My name is Sarah and I am coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. If you are new here, good luck. <laughs> the episode's going to be kind of long. Um, if you're a returning viewer, then you probably are wondering where I've been because it's been almost two months, but we'll talk about that. Uh, this is a podcast about basically fiber arts. Um, so I talk about knitting, crocheting, quilting, sewing, uh, maybe cross-stitching and tapestries, and we'll see what I get into. Um, I really can't be stopped. Anyway, but today I have mostly knitting, crocheting, and a lot of acquisitions. Like a lot. But also it's been like seven weeks. So let's just, let's just get into very quickly, where I've been. Um, I always find these kinds of videos really funny because it's like, why are you explaining why you've not been here? But I do feel kind of silly because the reason I've not been here is not for any sort of like major life reason. It's because of, I'm gonna call them shenanigans. I'm gonna, that's, that's, so one time I went to film and my hair didn't look good. So I did it. <laughs> the next two weeks I had plans some weeks after I was stressed at work, we had like a giant reorg twice. Um, so I'm like on a totally different team in a different part of the org working with like a totally different group of people. That was a very stressful transition. I mean, like the transition itself was okay. And like, I was okay with the reorg, but just like not really knowing like what I was going to work on and priorities and whatever. So I bit off all my nails. <laughs> And I didn't want you guys to see that. So that was like another couple of weeks of me like, maybe they'll just grow out again really quickly and then they'll be back. But they're 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 not back. They're still very, very short and tiny. Um, but you know what? That's fine. Um, I do have a good hair day today, but I don't have any nails. So it's fine. But so like that kind of happened. And then there were some weekends where I just had other plans and I couldn't quite slot in a video. And then last week I did have time on Tuesday. It was great. And I filmed a whole video, an hour and a half worth of rambling about all sorts of things, which I will reproduce today. I hope maybe with like more coherence though. Um, but it was like really, 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 really rough. <laughs> like I could tell that I hadn't been podcasting for a long time. So I don't know what I was talking about. And normally I don't know what I'm talking about, but even this felt like a lot for me. And I was like, I can't not edit this and I don't edit. So I was like, I'm just going to reshoot it. And then I was like, oh, wait, I don't have any other days this week that I can reshoot this. So anyway, here we are. Um, it is a Monday. So I'm doing this before work. I'm very excited. It's very rainy outside and gray. So hopefully the lighting is, I'm doing my best folks, I'm doing my best. But anyway, enough about that. Um, this will be the moment where I tell you that you should subscribe and hit the notification bell. Not because I'm necessarily trying to grow my followers because I don't, I don't really know what that does for me, to be honest. Um, I love that you all are here. Like, absolutely. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but I don't really understand like YouTube or Instagram or like monetization. Like I'm happy for it, but I don't really get it. So anyway, um, but the reason why you should do it is because I don't have a schedule and I've been trying really hard to be that person that is like very regular. And as you might have noticed, if you've been coming back, I can't do it. <laughs> so rather than like wondering when it's going to happen, they'll just tell you like, hey, there's a new video. And like, I, I'm going to try to shoot for like, something more consistent, but the reality is that it'll probably just be super random and I apologize for that. But also this is my hobby and it's summertime here and Madison is like the greatest in the summertime. Like this whole weekend, I basically was outside in the sun knitting and spending time with my friends. So I don't know about like a regular schedule, but I will try not to let it be two months between episodes because that's Anywho, you might be wondering, but Sarah, what, what is that you're wearing? What, what's on you? <laughs> well, this is, for those of you who are returning, the Basket Weaver Shawl by Stephen West. So let me just, um, first of all, let's just, the, the texture. So you've seen this before. You also might be wondering, like, what, what is all, <laughs> like, why is that so big? Um, this is knit in an alpaca blend. Um, I 
have talked about this shawl ad nauseum. It was part of my Stephen West uh, seven and six. So I was trying to do seven Stephen West shawls in six months. Um, this was one of the DK weight shawls that I was, not one of, I think it's the only DK weight shawl that I knit, which I think is going to be why in a second you'll understand like why this was a labor of love. First off, let me just start by saying it's a great pattern. Um, very easy to understand, very easy to get into a good rhythm with. Um, I think the impact of it is like pretty good. Like it's a very bold shawl, even though this is black, right? It's black, it's not really doing a whole lot, but you can still see the texture and the eyelets and it's just every person that has put this on has tried to steal it from me. It's that soft. So the alpaca that this came from was good old Katie from Galpaca Farms. We talked about Katie in my first episode. She is, I'm gonna go back this year and I'm gonna make her my friend. I, I feel very strongly that we got off on the wrong foot. And now that I'm wearing her, I feel like that's like a whole nother level of friendship that she doesn't know about. But maybe I'll wear my, I was gonna say maybe I'll wear this to meet her, but I don't know if that would make her more angry or if she would be like, that's what I thought. I don't know. I will say though that I gotta take this off because it is hot. Um, the high today is only gonna be 60. I don't know what the temperature is right now, but I'm already starting to sweat. That is how warm this is. So when winter comes back, uh, this will probably be the thing I wear like every single day. It's so warm, but maybe not something to wear in like September in Wisconsin. We'll see, maybe we'll get a cold in September. I hope not though. Anyway, let me show you why this took me so long. So I'm gonna start here and then just, <laughs> I can't even, I don't even know how to get all of this in. I just, y'all are just gonna have to work with me because I don't know. Like, it's just, there's so much y'all. What, what, why, who? Okay, so this, this behemoth, as I mentioned, is DK weight. Uh, the alpaca, which is a blend of, I believe, merino, alpaca, and bamboo, I believe, has a beautiful drape. So that contributes in part to just it sort of feeling like a very blankety type thing, a schlanket, if you, if you will. Um, but really, it's that I forgot it was DK weight. And the pattern, I think, is expecting, I think, I can't remember what the base fiber is that he recommends. But anyway, I think they're expecting something that's not so drapey and so heavy. And so it really got to a point where I was like, look, I was like knitting it and kind of lifting it up and it was covering my entire torso. And I was like, I still have the whole large section of these basket weaves, like basket, basket weaves. Why does that sound weird? Is that basket I don't know, it's a, that sounds weird, but I'm gonna go with it. So anyway, but I still have this giant large section of these basket weaves to do, and it's already covered my whole torso. Now we've talked about how I don't have a full-size torso. So on another person, perhaps that would not have been the case. But I was concerned because I was like, this is supposed to be like my winter scarf and it's gigantic, so how am I gonna wear this? And I was just like, you know what though, trust the process. Stephen West knows what he's doing. I kept knitting and then Katie stepped in from the beyond. She's, I mean, she's alive, the beyond on the farm and was like, no more fiber for you. <laughs> so I ran out of yarn, like within, I feel like I had one full repeat of the large basket weaves left and I just didn't have any more yarn and I held it up and was like, this is fine. <laughs> I can absolutely stop the shawl right now. No one will notice. And it's already so gigantic. Really, I should have probably not done the large section if I'm being real. So that's a hot tip for everybody. If you're going to make this and you don't, you're not like seven feet tall in heels. Um, I might only do the small and medium. You'll still get the same texture. It'll still have the same effect. It just won't be so big. And I can't remember from the pattern if he gives you an early out or not. But what I did was I just stopped early and I made sure that I ended um, at the end of a complete square. So I picked, I looked through the pattern, I saw where the increase row was. There's like a bunch of increase rows every 
basically every square. I picked one of those, kind of calculated how much yarn I had left, and then was like, I can probably get to the end of this square, and then I'm just gonna bind off in pattern and call it a day. And that's what I did. You know what, I lied. I lied. It's an I-cord. <laughs> I'm like, wait, in pattern with Stephen West? No, of course not. It's an I-cord cast off. So, very neat edging. But yeah, so that's the Basket Weaver Shawl. I loved making it. I will probably make another one. I might make it in a lighter color just to showcase the pattern more. But I just really think, even in black, it's just like a really impressive, I think it's a really impressive shawl. And if you make it in something luxury, and let me just, let me just, I'm, this is, this is for y'all because I feel like this is going to limit my options at Sheep and Wolves here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this with you. If you get Katie or one of her brethren, Sistrins, I don't even know, Alpacrins, we'll go Anyway, if you get one of the other alpaca or Katie, whatever, the yarn is actually not that expensive. So I almost thought to myself, like, let me just get another skein and finish it properly until I held it up and was like, this thing is... <sighs> but the yarn's not very expensive. It's not very expensive. And so we'll be getting some more alpaca from Galpaca at Sheep and Wool this year. But I just wanted to share that hot tip. If you've been meaning to make something in a, in a blend that is nice, it's very squishy, it's incredibly warm, um, just a beautiful fiber. So maybe all that, all that meanness, like maybe it's because she's mad that she's giving away like her, her precious commodity. Um, but I would absolutely recommend this yarn and this pattern. So Bask Weaver Shawl, Demon West, Galpaca Farms, alpaca blend in Katie. Now that was shawl five of seven. Uh, yes, five of seven. So you've seen the other four. You've now seen five. Let's take a look at number six. So this is the striped S Jan also by Stephen West. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. I'm sure. Now this turned out so good. It turned out so good. Like, look at this. Oh, 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 look at this border. Oh my God. So, okay, let me just, first off. So we talked about me making something cream colored and then everybody in the comments was like, it's purple. And I was like, it is purple, but I'm gonna claim it as cream anyway because this one stripe is cream. This, I'm gonna cheat. It's, it's my podcast, I could cheat and I'm gonna. So uh, this is a cream shawl <clears throat> with some purple tones to, to it. Uh, but really, I'm just so pleased with the border. So this is Sunset in Malabrigo Silk Paca and the cream is West Yorkshire Spinners in Milk Bottle, I think. And then of course, this is my favorite yarn uh, of all time for purple speckle, which is the life in the long grass pressed flowers. So I knew I had to rescue that from the Aurora cabin shawl. So glad I did love this shawl. So when I finished it, I feel like it was like this long and people were clowning me at knit night in particular, um, a fellow that comes on Monday, Matt was just like, that looks like a, like a, like a doily. And I was just like, Matt, if you don't, <laughs> he was not, he was not wrong. It, it was like this, and I was like staring at it and I had been pulling it and pulling it and being like, is this gonna be enough of a shawl? Because it looks really tiny, like really tiny. And then I was like, well, it is what it is because I have a whole nother shawl to finish. And so if this only covers like, just like my neck and like a little bit of my chest, so be it. Um, through the power of blocking, the power of blocking, I got this. Now you can see, it's a full size shawl. Let me try to let me try to stand and not knock over the three thousand things that I have set up very precariously for this video. Okay, so you can see, I think, that it like this is my natural waist, and it comes like it it dangles to my natural waist. Now you might be saying, okay, well that's kind of how blocking works. You are correct, but this is the small size of this shawl, the small. I've never made a small anything by Stephen West. To be fair, the, I've only made now six shawls by Stephen West at this point. So, but 
I did not trust it. And I think this pattern is from like 2015. So it's one of his early ones. Um, Stephen West, the deep cuts. <laughs> um, so it doesn't have an I cord. Um, doesn't have an I cord bind off. Doesn't have an I cord tab. It's got like a, uh, I think it's a uh, garter tab maybe. Look at me trying to see it while I'm wearing it. Okay, let me take this off really quickly because now I can't remember what the what the cast on is. I think that is a garter tab. I think it is. So you do that and then you basically kind of keep that edging. So it sort of simulates an I-cord, but it's not thick. I really like this. Like I, this was a very peaceful knit until I got to this border. Now the border itself is not challenging, but I kept... So for those of you who are aware of like Greek mythology or just have heard this word before, I was suffering from a very intense case of hubris. Why you might ask? Because I'd knit so many other more complicated things by Stephen West and I was like, Psh. this is like my TV knitting Stephen West, which I mean, it was until the lace and then I got to the lace and I was, I zipped through the first, zipped is being very, I'm, that's, it was very slow going. So zipped is, is not accurate in the least, but I got through it and it felt okay. And then I got to the next section and I was like, wait, are those holes in the right spot? And then I was like, they're not. So I had to undo and then redo checked the alignment of the holes again, checked against the picture, they were still wrong, but differently wrong. So that was that was a, some kind of progress. So I took it out again and then I did math. And then I like tried to like imagine like, okay, if the, if the double yarn over goes here and this stitch is on this side, I got there as you can see. <laughs> I got there, but you know, you can kind of tell a little bit towards the bottom. Part of this is how I blocked it, to be fair, because it got, it was so big and, and very wavy. I just had trouble and I was like, I don't actually need these to be pointy. So some of them look like they're misaligned because I didn't block it properly, but they're aligned. But the reason why it was so challenging is because I was taking it to knit night and I was working on it while talking and being like, I don't need to count. I don't need to. So for the final the final uh, stripe of the border. I don't know how many stitch markers I had on this thing, but I was like, okay, but for real, for real like, let me stop. Let me stop playing around um, and actually like count and stop taking this to knit night. So this became at home knitting in the morning, listening to, a, to a, an audiobook or a podcast and I got it done. And then I took it back to do the binding at knit night. But like, this was so it is a very easy shawl to knit. Highly recommend it. This border was spicy as I don't even know. Like it just, there's so many holes. There's so many holes and it doesn't really look right if you don't count. Just got, you gotta count. I would use the stitch markers. You get all of the ones that you've got, even if it's like every single repeat, I would just do that. Like there's no shame in using stitch markers. I love them. There is some shame in having to take off however many stitches this ended up being by the time I got to that third repeat, like three times. So uh, we're team stitch marker over here going forward on these Stephen West borders. So anyway, so those are my two finished objects. You might be wondering, wait, two, not three? Uh-huh, that is that is correct, that is correct. Let's just transition into works in progress, shall we? Let's just, let's just get there. <sighs> so I mentioned earlier that I was doing a seven and six. So seven Stephen West shawls in six months. Why, you might ask, because I'm a nutter and I like to set challenges for myself because life's not challenging enough. So. Um, were I not to have lost some mojo from Aurora, who I'm still going to blame, maybe for the rest of this year, if we're being, if we're being honest, um, and I hadn't had the snafu of that border on the striped S-Chan, you might be looking at a seven shawl, 
But truth be told, I just got sick of knitting shawls. And not forever. It's just that it got really warm here for a week. Like it was in that like late high 70s, 80s for no reason. Like Wisconsin. Anyway, but it was like, I realized I don't have a spring or summer wardrobe that is hand knit. I have a couple of tops. I have no clothing really that I want to wear. Um, we'll talk about that some other time, but they, they don't fit anymore. So, um, so I have things that I want to sew and I have things that I want to knit and I have some things that I want to crochet. And I was just like, this shawl is in the way. I'm tired of this shawl. And the reason why I was tired of it is not because I don't like the shawl. You will see in a minute, it's very lovely and it will get finished and it will get finished before September, like for sure. But it's just that it like wasn't TV knitting. Like I expected to like have the last shawl that I worked on be the striped S Jan, right? That was sort of the plan. I was gonna finish all the other shawls and then that was gonna be sort of my last minute shawl, but then that became easier to take with me until it wasn't. And I was like, well, I guess this is gonna be at home knitting, but then at home knitting for me needs to not require a lot of focus because I was knitting a bunch of other stuff. So anyway, it it's, doesn't really make sense, but like the shawl just, it required me to have to do more counting than I wanted to do while I was either out in public or while I was at home watching TV. So it was like sit in bed and listen to something and count and knit. And I was like, some mornings I am not into that. I just want to like zone out and do my thing. And so I reached for it less and then realized in a panic, like, oh no, I only have like two weeks left. And then I was like, well, I'll give myself that two week extension that I talked about, which I then did. And then I knit it for like maybe three of those 14 days. <laughs> and that was when I was just like, oh yeah, I'm over this. I don't want to knit this anymore. Um, at least like on the schedule that I created. So I was just like, nah, nah. Um, we're not doing like obligation knitting anymore. So like I set that goal for myself like last year and then tried to continue even though I had a whole shawl basically, I mean, like a half a shawl, but like I hated that shawl and I was so glad to get rid of it. But then like it should have been six and six. That is the reasonable thing to do instead of being like, Pff. I mean, yeah, I lost like a month of knitting, but I can make it up in two weeks, right? No, wh what? Why? What am I? I don't even know. I don't know why I do these things to myself. So anyway, I'm going to say that I succeeded in knitting six and a half shawls in seven months because I did. And I did not finish shawl number seven. The half is the Aurora Cabin shawl, by the way, which... This will be the last time we speak of her. Because, well, maybe not, because I really, 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 really hated that shawl. But I'm still going to count it because I put in all that work on it. And just because I didn't finish my painting honeycombs, which we were getting ready to look at, does not mean I failed. Because I say so. So I'm changing my own rules, which is that it was doing a six and a half and seven. And I, I won that challenge. So there. Okay. Now, let's look at what I did get up to. So the Painting Honeycomb Shawl by, you guessed it, Stephen West, um, is actually a beautiful shawl. Like, it's really, it's stunning. Um, and I will have mojo to finish it, just I'm not power knitting this because, like I said, it requires a very specific frame of mind, and I'm not in that frame of mind anymore. <laughs> in, in April, my body was like, nah, do we have easier things to knit? Things that don't require the brain for the whole thing? And I was like, hmm, yes, let me go find those things. But it is still very pretty. So let me show you. So this is the lovely stepped edge where you do your decreases. And then we've got a lot of width. So that's that's how far I got. So it's not, it's not super far. Um, but it's so pretty. It's just, it's so pretty. Now I was going to do like a fade or whatever. So I, you might recall that I'm using the sunset, no, not sunset, the sun Valley fibers. Um, it was like a mini fade skein that they had that had like a ton of really great colors. Um, so sorry for the rustling. I don't keep things in bags. I don't know where they are. Okay. So what I've got so far, is actually three colors so it's this color weirdly this faded really beautifully like you almost can't even you can kind of see a little bit of 
but it's like these are two separate colors which is just beautiful and then I kind of got to the middle and was like oh these don't really mm, oh well so we're just going with that and then the next color that I'm incorporating is a little bit lighter so it's like this will fade into this so it's like each pair fades into itself but they don't fade into each other which I don't I don't think I mind, but I was surprised. I did not expect that. So the last two colors that I'll be incorporating are these two. This is very orange on here. It is not. It's sort of like a dusty mauve. Um, and then this is like a lighter tannish version of the mauve. Um, so that will be down here. So we'll sort of end like we did up here with the lighter of the two colors. So those are my colors. Um, I cannot tell you the names of these colors because... Uh, First off, I didn't take pictures for the first ones, and then I sort of took pictures, and then I... I will figure it out. Maybe. It'll be on Ravelry if I do. They're all listed on Ravelry, it's just I'm not sure which color is which, but I know if I dig through all my pictures, the information is somewhere. So, um, oh, also, <laughs> so I decided to start using progress trackers, and so I have a little teacup. Anyway, I really, I'm really excited about this teacup. I stopped using it for a while for reasons, but um, that's that's where I'm at. So next time I show this to you, uh, we'll see how far down the teacup, or how far from the teacup I've gotten. I suspect it'll be like like two rows, but the teacup's cute. So there's that. So yes. Oh, sorry. Also, the main color, which I forgot to mention, is Malabrigo Ultimate Sock um, in a gray. It's called Grease, Gree, G-R-I-S. So love this, but it is much too hot to be knitting merino wool shawls with cashmere and what have you. That's just, I can't. So I almost got there, but since I reframed it, I did get there. It's, life is all just reframe it. Did you, did you fail or did you win at something else? Okay. So that's the Basker Weaver shawl. Now, that's that's the end of Stephen West for a while. Um, I may do another shawl-a-thon, but I'm thinking it might not be Stephen West, which is like, what? But I did an online class with Natasha Hornby maybe like a month and a half ago now, and she's like the queen of mosaic knitting, and I didn't know that you could do like pearl-forward mosaic knitting, and now I'm like, I might need to make some of her shawls and like experiment with like knits and pearls for like texture. So it might be a mini one because I will be doing the mystery cal this year. Stephen West mystery cal October. Um, but I'm just like, that would be kind of fun to like make some other shawls, like do some other stuff, but we'll see. Cause I do still have quite a few Stephen West shawls that I want to, that I want to knit, but okay. So that was my painted honeycomb shawl. Now let's move on to some new things that you have not seen. So first thing is that I wanted desperately to start making some kind of spring summer top because as I mentioned, I don't have a lot of, I have t-shirts, I have a lot of t-shirts and I have a couple of hand knit t-shirts like in cotton blends from last year, um, but I don't have enough and I wanted to have some variety in what I was wearing. But in the spirit of being a troll, but a happy one, like not, I'm not a mean troll. I never, I never mean troll people, but I do take a lot of pleasure and joy out of just being ridiculous, which maybe is a personality flaw. I don't know, but it, it entertains me and it doesn't usually hurt other people. So I feel like it's fine. But if you were here before, you might remember my petite knit rant about like, why is everybody named petite knit? Blah, blah, blah. And then I turned up in a Sophie scarf. Um, in the spirit of that, I also was ranting about why is everybody making everything in cream and beige? Like, and then I tried to co-opt that by making a beige shawl and y'all were just like not having it. Like that's not cream. And I'm like, mm. today I said it was cream though, so. But to further the joke, because why not joke knit? And I know some people are like, what? With the limited time that I have, why would I knit something as a joke? That's just how my brain is. It just is. The Sophie scarf was a joke too. And then I loved it and was like, ooh, huh. Well, <laughs> so I'm making a beige summer top. is 
the, the Soho Top by Kadri. And it is very, very beige. Now it looks dark. So I picked a darker beige because I am a darker person. I, I felt like that would make it more wearable for me than like an actual true beige. Um, Cause that I can't do. I, I It's a joke, but I, I would technically like to wear this. And I just kind of was like, I need it to actually like work with my skin tone. I think this one does. I think this one does. Um, shout out to Sam from Knit Group who literally was like, I hate it. And I was like, fair. <laughs> don't it is not a color anyone has ever seen on my person I'm trying to think back to even like high school I mean I was goth so like I absolutely was not wearing beige but maybe middle school I don't even think like as a child I wore beige I don't think so so like this is a lot for me <laughs> and it's really funny and I'm like I don't know I don't know why I'm like this but it just it gives me joy to work on it <laughs> because it's I don't know I did get it and I did get yarn. So this is, hold on a second. This is uh, Cascade Hampton in 70% Pima Cotton, 30% Linen. And I don't know the color offhand, but it'll be in the in the show notes below. Um, I did get some other me colors to make some other cotton tops, but I'm just really excited about this. So first of all, the construction of this is ingenious. I won't say more because it's a paid pattern, but it's very cool the way that this works up. And then... It's like a pizza flip. And then you just get to knitting in the round. So it's garter stitch in the round though. So for all my uh, my lovelies who detest purling, this is not your pattern. This is not your pattern because in order to do garter stitch in the round, every other row is purled. Now I have a very unique way of knitting, I think, which is that when I'm, so sorry, this is gonna be very weird because I don't actually have you know what? No, I can, I can, let me take my avocados off. Also, these are my avocados. Um, so when I'm knitting, the way that I do it is that I use my index finger to wrap. Wait, is that true? No, I use my, my middle finger to flick the yarn around the needle. But when I'm purling, it's the exact same motion. I just switch to my pointer finger because it's closer. So it's easier to get it around for the purl stitch and then the knit stitch. So that's that's the only difference is just which finger. So I don't mind purling. It's actually very easy for me and it's kind of this exact same motion. So, um, so this wasn't a huge deal for me, but I did get to that part in the pattern and was like, oh no, people are gonna be mad. I hope they read the patterns before they start knitting. I hope so. I hope they do because I didn't, didn't matter for me, but might matter for you. So that's just a heads up is that there will be a lot of purling to get from the underarms to the bottom. The one thing I will say, I did mess this up because I wasn't looking very, very closely, but there's this really nice detail down the side, which is like a sort of slipped, slip stitch of knit stitches. So you can see up here, I didn't do it because I was just zooming. And then I went, wait a minute, wasn't there something in the pattern that, oh, oops. So, I'm adding it now. Nobody, if you're that up under my armpit to see that first like inch that I didn't do, like what are you doing under there? So anywho, I love this. Definitely recommend the pattern. Really excited to wear it. It might be a little bit big. Like I've been kind of looking at it like, mm. um, like it might be wide maybe is a better way to put it. I don't have the widest shoulders. Although weirdly, all of my yoga teachers are always like, you have really broad shoulders. And I was like, first of all, what? Like, don't say stuff like that to people. Like, that's so weird. Now, I like had a complex for forever about like, oh, I have like man shoulders or something. Like, why would you say that? So weird. Like women have all sorts of sizes of everything and also not women. Everybody is different. Like stop talking about people's bodies. Weird. Anyway. They're not that broad though. So they're kind of rounded. And so I'm like, this might actually be too broad, <laughs> but I'm making the size that's supposed to fit the girls. So eh, we'll see if, if need be, I will do something. Some, I'll ask people how to make it. It's like a boat neck. So it'll be kind of a drapey front. And I think that's where the difference is, is that if it was stretched, it would be like off my shoulders, but I think it's supposed to be worn like here. And then this is supposed to be kind of like a beautiful cowl necky kind of thing. We'll see. So love this, very excited about this. 
really excited that it's beige, even in my hand. Like, I just think it complements my skin so well. So this is two, two crows that I've eaten. So petite net and beige. But I was talking to a friend last week and I had a realization that I could have made the joke of all jokes by picking a petite knit pattern and made it in beige. And I did have, I swear, like a half hour of remorse that I had not thought of that until I was basically like a quarter of the way down the body of the Soho top. Now I'm not gonna say that I don't love the Soho top. I do, and I'll be wearing it forever. But the joke could have been so much more. I'm not gonna make another beige top though. I'm just not gonna do it. So, so this is my one and only beige. And so I will probably be making some other petite knit pattern because there's some sweaters that I've got my eyeballs on, but I won't be making it in beige. Maybe in cream though. Never say never. I mean, look at look at me over here in May 2023, just upending all of my assumptions. So anyway, highly recommend. Oh, okay. The thing that I'm getting ready to show you next, I was so desperate to cast on since like January, I think. And I couldn't because of those shawls. Now I could have in hindsight, right? But you know, so I didn't. And then this past week, like I want to say it was maybe a week ago, week and a half ago, something like that. I just was like, you know what? Dang it. I'm casting on some socks. Like I'm tired of not casting on these socks. And so I did. So first of all, let me show you the yarn that I picked. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the pattern. So <laughs> I made these little tiny balls. So the pattern calls for a main color and a contrast color. And for the cuff, the contrast color, you need 25 yards, I believe it said. So I did a bunch of math. This is leftover evergreen fiber works. Fiber works? Why does that sound funny to me today? I think that's right. Um, their sock base in Fossil, which I had used in my Stephen West um, winter light shawl. So I had some of this left. So I measured it out. I did, you know, had my little scale out and was like, okay, so for 463 yards or whatever it is, like if I need 25 yards and how many grams would that be? And so I mathed, which I was very proud of myself. And I figured out I needed seven grams to get 25 yards. So I said, great. So this is still left over, so I barely did it. I think, I think it's that I didn't make the cuff very long. And so like, you know, so I think I'm gonna measure this. I forgot to weigh this and see how much it is, but there might be enough in here to make like another pair of socks with this, like these little balls. So I'm very excited. But then I went, cause I said, I don't know what color to pair this with. So I went to Fiddlesticks, local yarn shop, shout out. Um, and I was like, I want something that kind of works with this. So let me hold this closer. This isn't, you're not really gonna be able to see it, but it's got kind of some like mossy green, some like brown. It's It's got like some interesting speckles in it, which is what I really liked, hence the name Fossil. So I found some West Yorkshire spinners in this lovely green, and I don't remember the name of this color either. This is gonna be a bit of a, of a pattern is that I won't remember the name of things because my brain, but this is the green that I chose. So it's a very sort of like mossy, boggy type green, and I thought it would be really pretty because this has this color sort of speckled throughout. You can't see it as well because it's a tiny little sample, but I just thought that'd be really cool. So with these two colors combined, I cast on the Kigi socks. And here's what I have so far. Now I'm gonna warn you that I'm knitting these two at a time on one circular and that circular is 32 inches because I didn't have two needles of the same brand that I could use. <laughs> All these size one needles I've got floating around, I don't have matching ones anymore because they're occupied by socks that I've long forgotten and somehow can't frog. So I thought, you know, let me go to my other yarn store, which I guess isn't local because it's a half hour drive now, but I went to Sow's Ear and I said, can I do two socks at a time on one? 32 inch needle or do I need to get like a 40 or a 47? And the lovely lady behind the counter said, no, 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 you can, I'm, I knit socks all the time. It's a little bit tight and cramped, but you can do it. And she was correct. I can do it. However, I don't know that I would do cuff down 
on a 32. Why? Because you end up with all those gusset stitches that you have to decrease and it's dicey. I'm not going to lie. Like luckily, as you can see, I've got all the stitch markers. So again, we're not playing around. I'm just like, I, I, I can't. Um, but it has like popped over to the other needle. It's been weird. Um, let me just actually just show you the socks really quickly and then talk to you about the two at a time struggle of a cuff down because I was not prepared and this is my first time doing it on one needle and I also have taken like a 10 year break from knitting socks so it's also been a hot minute but let me just show you these cuffs because the reason that I wanted to knit these is because of the cuff so do you see this look how pretty is that so this is called the quilt stitch oh wait sorry this is the Kigi sock by Yucca forgot to actually tell you the, the designer's name. Um, it's just like such a brilliant stitch. So I don't want to give too much away because again, it's a paid pattern, but it is a very easy to knit textured stitch. And I think it is probably like everyone that has seen it has been like, Ooh, what stitch is that? So like, if you want people looking at your ankles, you're not feeling too Victorian and you want, you want to show a little ankle, this, is the pattern I think that you want because the sock itself is going to be pretty simple like it's a it's a rib like a one by three rib or something like that but the cuff is where all the magic is and it's very very easy I knit these cuffs in maybe two days and two at a time so there we go now why was this a bit of a of a struggle for me part of it is just I'm rusty um you know when you spend a lot of time doing something you get really good at it generally speaking like that's sort of the whole point of like repetition but when you take 10 years off it's got to come back and oh, sorry i've got katie on my mouth i just like why um so my normal method of sock knitting had been two different methods method number one is one sock at a, one sock at a time on a circular needle and that there are no problems with that, right? Because no matter what the pattern is doing, you're going to only have that one sock and your one ball, or in this case, two balls of yarn to sort. That's it. So if the you have to shift some stitches over here or over there, you've got to do a decrease that's spanning a couple of stitches in the middle, it's fine because you can just slide them around and redistribute and you're good. In this case, because I was doing them both on one needle, that did not work. Now, the other method that I used to use was two at a time on two circulars. And you might think that, that would be easier. But when I started to think about it, I was like, would I be in a better position if I did that? And I was like, I don't think so. Because the problem that arose with this pattern is that when you initially do your cast on, you cast on, so for the size that I'm making, which is a standard 64 inch sock, for the cuff, you only cast on 60 stitches. But every other sock that I've made, you evenly divide when you're doing two at a time on either two or one circular, you evenly divide those stitches in half. So there would be 30 stitches on one and 30 stitches on the other, or 30 stitches on the front, 30 stitches on the back, whatever you're doing. This pattern sets you up after the fact, and I did read through the pattern, but I like missed it because it didn't really register, but you have an uneven number of stitches on the front and the back. So the back has, I think, 31 stitches by the time you're done with your increases and 33 on the front. So I got through the cuffs and it was quite a hassle with the little tiny balls and trying to like flip them and everything was tangled. So that, that was also a lot but it was manageable. It was annoying, but it was manageable. And I was loving how the cuff was coming out. So I was, it was, it was fine. I was okay with it. It wasn't until it was like, okay, you've now done your extra increase. Like now start doing your heel flap on 31 stitches. And I went 31, 30, 31, not 32. And then I like reread and I was like, oh no, <laughs> no. So then I was sort of thinking like, okay, but I can still do this because I still have two separate balls attached to each sock. I no longer have the little tiny, you know, the evergreen fiber balls, like those are done. So it'll get a little tangled, but it'll be okay. And I was like, I think I can still knit through and then just like skip that stitch. 
And then I started knitting it and I was like, what exactly is getting ready to happen? So long story short, it can be done. It can be done. It requires you to slip the stitches that you aren't working unworked onto the needle because here's what where my brain did not process this properly when I first was like I'll just skip the stitch and then just go to the next sock because I don't need that ball of yarn you don't need that ball of yarn what you need is the needle <laughs> you need the needle so like I got to the end of the the part where you do the heel flap and then you were supposed to turn and I went oh oh, I can't do this because the needle is not going to be in the right place to work the next sock. So I had to slip the remaining stitches for the first sock unworked. I put some stitch markers in so that I knew like these are unworked. And then I could work the next sock to the same spot and then turn everything, work the second sock, then come to those unworked stitch stitches on the first sock, slip those, and then continue the pattern. So it was a lot of braining to get the heel turn and also start these like gusset decreases because... I didn't have them set up properly. So I made a note on my Ravelry and was like, in the future, when you cast on this sock again, because I will make these again, like don't cast them on like this, like put 29 on one and 31 on the other. And then that way, when you do your increases, you'll end up with 31 and 33, and then you won't have to do all this weird shuffling. Um, but it was pretty wild. Although, you know, you might still need to. Now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, it will change the numbers, but I think you still will need your needle. So anyway, it was just, cuff down is not something I ever did two at a time. Um, and it's weird. It is weird. And I didn't expect it to be as weird as it is, but it's working. So, you know, give it a shot. See how, how it goes for you. You could also probably, I'm sure, like, get the pattern and like reverse engineer it to be toe up if you wanted to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy with them. I just think they're so pretty. They're so pretty. They're worth they're worth all the braining that I'm being forced to do to, to knit these. So Kiki Socks by Yucca in West Yorkshire Spinners, Color Unknown, and Evergreen Fibers Fossil. Okay. Oh, and I finally got to break out my cocoon tree bag in these like beautiful vases. So in my previous life, I was an archaeologist. Um, well, I was an archaeology grad student. I'd never actually became like a full archaeologist in the field because I'd have to move to Europe to do that and I didn't want to. So, um, but I love this bag because it just reminds me of all the like pots I used to dig up and what have you. So just so pretty. Okay. Oh, folks, I hope you had a beverage and maybe a snack because I don't, we're 47 minutes in. I'm not even done with my whips and we're just going to keep, we're going to press on, but if it takes you two weeks to watch this, I'm that's fine. <laughs> okay, so I also, in the spirit of it's spring and I want to knit fun things, decided that I was going to cast on a beautiful summer vest. I don't wear vests. So this is a lot of like, I don't do X and then me being like, but why not? And trying to really reevaluate, like, what is the reason behind this, like, decision to not do a thing? And, like, what happens if I do do it? Like, what will I learn about myself? Um, so I don't wear vests. But I thought to myself, maybe this time I'll wear a vest. So park knit. I feel like that's, it's park and knit, I think. But everybody just calls her park knit or park. So I don't, I'm always confused about like how to refer to folks by their like names. Is it's like, do I call them what it says on Ravelry or do I call them what people call them? And <laughs> I don't, I don't know. So I'm just going to refer to her as park knit because we're not friends. I can't call her park yet, but maybe we will be in the future. Um, she has this beautiful sea breeze vest that is just the like definition of summer. So it's sort of a fisherman's, fisher, like a fishnet vest with like this kind of v-neck but the v-neck is closed and it has these little tiny almost like cap sleeves it's just like a really pretty breezy looking vest and so I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna cast it on I really want to but I want to make it in a white because it's summertime do you see look at me branching out trying to do not black not gray although I am wearing just realized I'm wearing gray top but anyway we're not gonna talk about that um so let me show you what I've got because I could not be more over the moon about this vest. So, this is what I have. Bring it a little bit closer so that you can maybe make out 
the speckles and this yarn. So the yarn is from a pseudo local dyer. It's Oh My Fibers, which I believe is based in Michigan. I think that's right. Um, and it is their DK base in the colorway Rainbow Sherbert, which I was like, absolutely. So it just looks like Fruit Loops. It looks like a ray, like it's just, you. even from here you can see it. So if it looks like, there's, is that discoloration? It is, it's the speckles. So my understanding of this pattern was not good. <laughs> I cast on, I got what I thought was the front panel, or sorry, the back panel done really quickly. I think that the fisherman's, what I don't know what to call this, the fishnet pattern, the fishnet, yeah. Um, it's just really, it's not very hard to follow and because it's so many yarn overs, like I think it moves pretty quickly. And also it's it's knit on, I think size six needles. So you're doing a bigger stitch with a lot of opening, you know, a lot of uh, yarn overs. So you've got a lot of like open space. So it, it really goes pretty quickly. Um, but I spent a lot of time when I got done with the back being confused because it was like, okay, so for the front, do you X? And I was like, the front. And I said, where is the front? And then I panicked because I was like, oh, I think I don't have a front panel. I think I'm supposed to make another front panel. So I was like, but I reread, I read this whole pattern and I don't, I don't remember there being a front. Like, I'm like, wait. So then I went back, I reread the pattern again and was just like, what front? I was so confused because it was like on the front, do X. And I was like, so then I went to Ravelry because I was like, okay, surely the test knitters caught this because that's like a pretty glaring mistake that there's like a whole piece missing, <laughs> read through all of those comments and not one person was like, yeah, that was really weird that there was no, no front panel. So then I was like staring at this pattern and I was staring at my pieces and I was like, what is going on? And then as I want to do, I was out with a friend knitting, ranting about this, <laughs> this pattern. And I was just like, I don't know where the front is, blah. And then I held it up and be like, like, like what is, like, do I just make another? And then I went, oh, I see armholes. <laughs> And I was like, oh, the top is the bottom. So when you cast on the cast on edge, which you do provisionally, ends up being the top of the neckline. So you're actually knitting it from top down. And then you pick up provisionally, or you pick up those provisionally cast on stitches and come over the shoulder. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But like... It's ingenious. It's ingenious. And the way that the other parts come together and the, like, I'm just like, whose brain works like this? Like whose brain works like this? Because I would never in a million years have been able to put all of this together for this pattern. Like could not. Even now, like, I mean, I'm on the body. So I've gotten everything joined together. Everything is looking great. I've got, you can see the V in the middle, which will be kind of cinched together with some ribbing, I believe, once I get done with the body. But it's just like, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. It was like a really great brain teaser. Um, and I'm just like so excited to wear it. I also used my little donut stitch toppers because they're speckled just like, the, anyway. Um, the one thing that I will say as a heads up, is I did lose track of the pattern a little bit. So I know I said like, it's really easy, it is. But the last stitch of every other row is either knitted or it's a yarn over. And I just, again, I got cocky. I got so comfortable with the pattern. I had done like inches and inches and inches and was like, Pff. and then I looked at it and was like, that looks really strangely shaped. And I was like, I guess maybe it's because like the way that the, holes are it's sort of pulling it in a diagonal I was like oh, okay and then I the more I knit I was like oh wait a minute and then I looked more closely and it was actually that I had added a stitch at the end and so I had like a whole extra row which gave it like a wonky goitery type look and I had knit eight inches past that point just let's just take a minute to uh to sit with that <laughs> And then I just really was like, am I going to have to rip out eight inches of fishnet? 
So I looked at it and I thought, maybe I can block this out. And I was like, well, I can't block it out because it's literally a whole nother stitch and it's very visible. And I thought maybe I could fold it under. And I was like, I don't know what's coming later, but I don't know that I can fold it under and still do the ribbing. So no. And so after I, so this is, and for those of you who've been here, you know that this is how my brain works, where instead of just doing the thing that is the thing to do, I spend a lot of energy trying to find a shortcut so that I don't have to do the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And so I spent all this time. And in the end, I was like, I just got to rip it out. <laughs> I just have to rip it back. I was like, it was fast knitting the first time. It'll be fine. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it was, it was a struggle. Um, I wish I could have just folded it under and, and been done with it. But I am much more happy with it now that it is proper, but I had to put a lifeline in. And then I ripped to the lifeline, which was about maybe four or five rows before the, the extra stitch. And then what I did is I like un, I tinked back very slowly so that I could understand what all of the stitches looked like in sequence so that when I got to the error, I could figure out what the error was. And that is how I discovered, oh, there's an extra yarn over here. And on this row, I was supposed to end with a knit stitch and not a yarn over. And so that was good because it helped inform me after I got the error resolved to remember like, okay, put a stitch marker before the last stitch of every row and then make sure that you're ending with either that knit stitch or the yarn over and not one or the other in the wrong place. So it ended up being fine and I salvaged the, the vest, but it, it is kind of funny. And I also am now like in a weird place where like I've done another thing that I can't really say um because it's also pretty ingenious but it's slanting slightly so I think I've misplaced a stitch again but I was just like you know what I'm just gonna go with it I'm not gonna re-knit all of this just to maybe figure out that it is just gonna be slanted so I'm okay it's it's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine okay so that was the sea breeze vest by park and knit park knit park. All right. Now for you hookers, I got some crochet for you. Okay. So I, uh, in addition to being desperate to cast on a pair of socks, I've also been feeling a little bit sad that I don't have a mosaic crochet project on the hook. Um, I finished my pillow, which was a, a roaring success. And then I was like, but what do I make now? And so it was going to be a project I'm going to show you later. And then it was also going to be another pillow. And then it was also going to be a crochet sweater. But then I was like, oh, crocheting clothing's not as easy as people said it was. So, hmm. so I thought, what if I made a blanket? Let's do some home, some home deck. Um, some folks at work decided that we should have a blanket cow. And I thought, I'll, instead of knitting the blanket, like everyone else is doing, like I'll crochet a blanket. So I picked a pattern. It is One for the Road by Martin Up North. And I'm knitting it in my all-time favorite acrylic, Karen Simply Soft. Now, I am still not sure about these colors. And in speaking with my friend last week, two weeks ago, it doesn't matter. Speaking with my friend, she suggested that I do kind of like a color swap. So like I start with one color, I use it for the full repeat. I then continue that color, but I switch out the secondary color or vice versa, right? Switch out the first color or the secondary color. But basically you sort of have one color that continues and then a new color introduced and then that one will continue. And then, so it kind of like allows you to add more colors because what I really wanted was for this blanket to complement my pillow. But if I'm being real, this blanket, I think takes like 2,500 yards of worsted weight. That Barocco Lanus is like 1350 a ball for like maybe 200 or 300 yards. So when I was doing that math, I was like, nope, nope, nope. Can't be using the Lanus. I really want to but I would have to like buy a skein like every month or something. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know how I would work it, but I was like, I don't feel right in my spirit <laughs> to, to, put, to buy like 15 skeins of that yarn in one go. I can't. And I don't want to like potentially run out of yarn or have them discontinue a color because I'm not a fast crocheter. Um, and so I just was like, I gotta use something else. 
And then I remembered Karen Simply Soft from my olden days. And I was like, oh, I really love that yarn. Let me try. I also love Vanna's Choice. Um, but I was like, let me just like grab some of that. And of course, Joanne did not have the best selection of colors. So when I got there, I thought, you know what? I'm going to let the universe decide for me my colors. I had a sense of the pillow. So it wasn't like I was just going to be making like a purple and like hot pink, <laughs> you know, it was like something that is in the pillow that sort of complements the pillow. And so this is what I came up with. Now on camera, <clears throat> it's probably looking very weird. The colors are probably, you're like, does that complement your pillow? This is as close as I could get. This is as close as I could get. So there is yellow in the pillow and there is like a coral, but this is more like a hot orange coral and like a, like a cheeseburger yellow instead of like a delicate yellow. So I don't know how I feel about this. I like the pattern. So you can actually see that it's the patterns coming in already. And I think the pattern is actually, um, like I love the finished product. So I'm excited to knit this pattern. I did have to start over the age old witch hole <laughs> question that people who are newish to crochet have was, uh, I was asking it pretty much every row and I was answering it incorrectly. So I did finally figure out a system that works for me that seems to be getting me what the pattern is supposed to look like. And so I'm just gonna go with that system from now on, but I'm still not sure I'm actually doing it properly. And they seem somewhat slanted, but I think that is more a function of it not being blocked, maybe? Like they just seem kind of loosey-goosey at the at the bottom, so it flares a little bit. But these ones are straight, so I think I think I'm okay. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't love these colors. So in thinking about what my friend said. And thinking about the pillow, I thought, you know, maybe it's because these two colors are together. And if I incorporated a white, a teal, and a black, which are the colors of the pillow, like maybe breaking them up, they won't look as neon as they look here. Because, I mean, even here, like in person, they're a little bit more muted, but they're not, it's not a lot more muted. And actually when I only had, I think like this much, like someone at Knit Night said that it looked like pink lemonade bacon. And that, I didn't knit this for a week after that comment because I was like, oh, it does. I was like, no. And then people were like, yeah, it's only because you have three rows though. If you, once you get more rows, it won't look like bacon. And I was like, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know where this is going. I don't love it. And I bought 14 skeins of Karen Simply Soft. So I did confirm with them that I can return them. So I might actually just make this in like black and white because that's kind of what I want to do. And but I started this over twice. And I mean, that's not a lot of work, but it is a lot of hours. <laughs> It doesn't look like a whole lot, but it's it's single crochet. So this is another thing is that when I chose this pattern, it didn't really dawn on me what I was knitting. And so my friend who crochets was like, is that a single crochet blanket? And I was like, no, 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 there's definitely double crochet. I saw it in the pattern. And they were like, but it's just for the like legs for the double crochet to connect to the color below though, right? Like the rows are single crochet. And I was like, I don't think so. And then I looked at it and I was like, oh no, it is single crochet. It is single crochet. And then these are double crochet. So like folks, I this blanket is, so let me just. I don't know what size this is. I think it's probably gonna be twin size, maybe. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. So I need to love it is what I'm saying because it's a lot of work. One row is like a half hour or something. So part of me is like, mm, I can just keep working on it because I bought the yarn or I can return all that yarn to Joann's and just get black and white. And I know that I won't hate that because I've never hated a black and white anything. Like that combination always pleases me. So it feels like kind of giving up, but also it's like, I don't want to knit, or sorry, I don't want to crochet something that I'm going to find hideous and that I'm not going to use or give away. Like could give it away, but I don't know about like, I'm just not that generous. 
if I'm just being honest, I don't want to knit a giant blanket, crochet, knit, quilt, whatever. That's actually not true. I will quilt and give those away. I have done that. Somehow it's different when I knit and crochet. I don't really want to gift those things when they're that gigantic. I just, I can't do it. So anyway, when you see me next, this may not exist. Or if it does, it'll exist in hopefully different colors. Or I will have like won the lottery and I can buy the Barocco lot <laughs> and crochet it in the yarn I really want to use. But we'll see. I could just start off. If, if I do black and white, I would feel better about buying the skeins incrementally because no one discontinues black and white. So like that I wouldn't have to worry about. But like Karen Simply Soft, I think without a sale at Joann's is $5.49 for, hold on a second. Ugh. It's $5.49 for 315 yards. So I want to say the Barocco Lanus is, well, it's $13.50 at Sunset Yarns here in Madison. And I think it's like, oh, I don't want to just guess. But it's it's not it's not $3.15, I don't think. I think it's less than that. So you're getting less yardage for almost three times the price. And obviously Joann's has sales all the time, right? So like I actually ended up getting these, I think for $3.79 a skein. You can't, it's just like, I, financially speaking, the, the move is to just use the Karen Simply Soft. Like that's just, but it also just might be nicer to, to crochet as well. It's, it doesn't have the same feel as it had when I was using it in grad school, not gonna lie. Um, not enjoying it as much as I thought I would. So, hmm. okay, so that is the One for the Road blanket by Martin Up North in Karen Simply Soft in Sunset and, okay, I literally just grabbed it and forgot already. Sunset and khaki. No, sorry, that's another language. Sunset and persimmon. So there we are. Okay, so my last work in progress, which you've seen before, which I abandoned and then I unabandoned, so it's 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 back to being worked on, is the Lento by Joanna. Sorry, I always mess up this name. By Jana, Jana Hiatala. Something like that. Sorry. I just anyway. Here we are, the Lento. So I missed the Let's Lento Cal, didn't finish, forgot to post, but I have finally joined the sleeves and now I can knit the body. And I'm very excited to finish this for next winter. It is too warm to wear, I think now, although it is very open. So you're knitting it on giant needles and it is a fingering and a lace weight held together. So it's actually like a pretty lightweight sweater, but it feels fuzzy and I'm using um, the Evergreen Fibers uh, Surrey Silk Haze, I believe it's what it's called. Um, actually, I'm gonna show you the skein again because every time I touch this, I just get so excited. This is the colorway Black Opal. So using this, and I'm holding it with the Magnolia, sorry, the Ultimate, not Ultimate, what is it called? It's on here, Universal. Don't have to use my brain. So the Universal Magnolia in the colorway Almond. So I'm using these two together. And because this is a modal and silk blend, which is just like a luscious blend, um, it's not really marling in the way that I was expecting. I was expecting the evergreen to come forward a lot more, and it does. You can see, like, it's very clearly there, but you get a lot of the, the um, magnolia as well. So it's sort of like a mottled or speckled sweater instead of it sort of like being a, a true blend of the two fibers. And I really like how that works out. So let me just show you up close so that you can see. So, like, each leg of the magnolia is very pronounced. I just think that's so cool. I've never seen yarn sort of act that way before when you like are holding it with a mohair or an alpaca. So very excited. So yes, so this is, is we're back to it, folks. We're back to it. And I'm feeling good about it. I think I'm going to finish this probably sometime later in the summer, but I'm going to be plugging away so that it's not just like this giant lift come September because that's where I'm at now and it doesn't feel that great to be like I have to power knit everything so I can wear it right now. 
do y'all knit for the season or preseason? Like I've tried doing like a season or two ahead, but like one thing I don't want to do is knit winter wear at the beach, which I did last year. Um, I don't recommend that. Um, but then it's like trying to be two seasons of head. It's like, okay, so, but I could knit like spring things at the beach, but then I'd have to knit the winter things like in the spring. I'm just like, this is a lot of like logistics to try to like, but then I don't knit that fast. And so I don't have tops to wear right now and it's warm out. And I'm like, see, this is like how people who plan ahead, maybe they, they're, some, they're onto something there. I don't know. Okay, um, so those are all my whips. There are so many of them. I'm trying to be much better about working on them, but I haven't been, I've just been, I've had favorites and that's how it is. Um, but because that's not enough to be working on, I thought, you know what I also should do? I should resurrect a project. So Mandy over at Mouse's Makes has, I forget what it's called now. I want to say it's like, oh, I've forgotten. It's like this, the cabinet of despair or the shelf of despair, something like that which I love. And they're just like abandoned projects, like stuff that got worked on that got put away and hasn't been finished. And so every now and again, she'll grab something off the shelf and she'll make it. And it's like, that's such a great idea because I have stuff that I obviously should be frogging and I just don't, I haven't yet. But then I have things where I'm like, oh, I really loved that. Like, I can't believe I didn't finish that. So I'm like, why don't I pick up a project every so often and try to get it finished so that I can wear it? Because then it's not a whip. It's not a UFO <laughs> and it'll be on my person, which I think is the most important of all of these things. So what I decided, apologies, but also it's just a little, little hair jizz for you. Um, what I decided to do was reach way back into the machine. <sighs> Can't make that noise, but just think about the doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, to a sweater that I started in, I believe 2010. <laughs> And it was during my 1940s retro period. So I've had a lot of strange fashion periods in my life. Um, strange, not in a bad way, just like, huh, I don't do that anymore. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, I had like the, I bought all that like different hair books to like figure out how to like get certain quaffs, which I would do with like lots of pins and whatever. Luckily my hair is textured, so it was a lot easier to hold it in a lot of those shapes than I think other type hair can do. Um, but yeah, so I had the hair, I would wear the bright red lips, I had, you know, sort of the long red nails, I sewed a lot of like reproduction 40s dresses, wore the heels, the whole thing. So it was, it was a lot going on. And I'm like, where did I have the energy and the time to do those things? Because I do not have them now. I'm lucky if I'm wearing a different pair of pants most of the time. So don't know, don't know. Um, but it was fun and I looked amazing. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe I'll go back to that. I don't know. And maybe the way to back is to finish the sweater. So this came from the A Stitch Above book by Suzanne Crawford that came out around that time. And it was a bunch of reproduction 40s patterns that were like sweaters, hats, and, and, um, and gloves. So I made a pair of the gloves. They're my favorite gloves of all time. They're knit flat, which is wild in hindsight. Cause I'm like, did I really do that? I did. And I loved those gloves and probably will make another pair because I wore them so much that they got holes in them. And I haven't worn them probably in five years though, since because, but love them, love those gloves. But I also made two sweaters. Well, one and three quarters of a sweater. So this is the one that I want to to grab and I'm going to call this segment forgotten faves to finish because they are faves. This is just a cute little wool tee and the pattern is called it cannot fail to please. And I agree. It, it absolutely cannot. When this thing is done, I mean, you can't tell me nothing. So, it is just a gorgeous textured, basically t-shirt. And it's got these lovely little puff sleeves. And I knit it in a sock yarn. And I don't remember the details of the sock yarn anymore, but I think I might, hold on. I believe I've got one full, I do, look at that. I have one full skein. So this is, it was the Mega Boots by Lana Grossa. And 
let me just hold this up to you again so that you can understand why it's unfinished. So first off, do you notice anything about this yarn? Maybe that it's striped? Do you see that there's like a stripe running here? Now, in the olden times, I was very meticulous. I'm a little bit less meticulous now. A little bit. I still get, I still get, you know, I'm still me. But this is a sleeve that is separate, that you knit separately. The whole thing is knit in pieces that you seam together. So here's a shoulder seam that is not done yet. And then here is the arm side that I will fit a sleeve into. So this sleeve was knit separately and I color matched these stripes to make sure that it all flowed together. <laughs> and so now I'm staring at this and I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. I haven't touched this sweater in a decade and I do not remember anything about this like anything about this. Like I'm staring at the pattern. I reread parts of it and was like, how am I gonna match up these stripes? Like how? I do not know. I, do, I don't know. And I'm just like sitting here, I'm so mad at old me, like past me for not just casting on the sleeve. Because if I had just done that, I would have matched the color back then. And all I'd have to do now is finish the knitting and then fit the sleeve in and sew up the, the shoulder seam and put the collar on. But as it is now, I got to like, re, like retroactively remember my type A personality from 2010, which was right after I finished my, my PhD. So I had a lot of energy then because I was so happy to be finished. And I think the like color matching was just like, oh, why wouldn't I do that? And now I'm just like, why though? Like, it's going to be beautiful if I can figure it out. But there's just, I'm like, I just, so anyway, that's why it's not done. Because in the 13 years since I started, I just, every time I pull it out, I'm like, oh, the color matching. That's, I can't, I can't be bothered with that right now. But the longer I can't be bothered with it, the worse it gets. So this is going to be my forgotten fave to finish. And I don't know when I will finish it, hopefully by the end of the summer. But that will give me enough time to get the courage to actually like start doing some like like cast on a sleeve and see like what's the color change and like maybe I have to rip it out and start over again. It's likely, but at least it's not like I mean it is a giant sleeve because it's a puffy sleeve. So it isn't it isn't like a tiny sleeve like normal, but it's still not the whole body of the sweater. So I'm going to try. I'm going to try wish me luck because I just don't know that I have the patience these days for this kind of level of detailing, but I'm going to have to have it because I want this sweater and I want to wear it and it still fits, which is a miracle. <laughs> I put it on the other day and was like, huh, all right, 1940s, because they usually, they're very baggy blousey type t-shirts. Um, and so the blousiness is helpful because I've got a little bit more uh, to put in the blouse, but it still fits. So I, that's even more incentive to like finish it up because like it still fits. So anyway, okay. So that is all the knitting and crocheting. Um, we are now going to move into the portion that is very embarrassing, which is my acquisition, my acquisition section. But before that, I wanted to remind everybody that starting September 1st, I will be running a ranunculus cowl. Um, I think I'm going to call it the like, I still don't know. I'm still torn between late to the party and miss the boat. I kind of like miss the boat. I don't know why that one speaks to me, but late to the party also seems really funny to me. So I haven't decided, but we are going to knit a ranunculus in September or longer, however long you want to take. Um, but I just am highly entertained by the fact that I haven't made one. And so many of you said that you hadn't either and you wanted to. And some people were actually like planning to start one and didn't realize I was going to do a cal in September. And so now they're going to join, which is great. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a good time. Um, I think that we are going to have some fun prizes. So I'm still sort of collecting prizes and like figuring out like what I want to do. Um, but I will go on record to say that there will be a skein of Ching Fibers Melted Baby Surrey as one of the prizes because I've already picked it. So highly recommend that you join and you know, let's get on this missed train <laughs> together. Okay, acquisitions. I've been in a state. When I'm in a state, I bite my nails and I buy things. 
it's not the best coping strategy, but it's one I can do. And so I have been doing it. <laughs> So apologies. Um, this is this. I just this is going to be this episode. I cannot take two months off again because this is wild. It's wild. But here we are. So let's start with my tools. I've separated my acquisitions into tools, books and yarn. Um, so I'm going to try to move relatively quickly through the tools because they're not that you know what? They are exciting. I'm not even, yeah, I'm not even going to say that. They are very exciting. All of it's exciting. I wouldn't be showing it to you. So let's just give a quick shout out to once again, Fiddlesticks, because um, we have a lending library there. And what that means is that folks can bring in supplies, yarn, needles, crochet hooks, whatever they've got, scissors, whatever they've got that they don't want to use anymore. They donate to the store. And then the store basically has a section called a lending library that people can come and take things from. So if you need a size 18 or sorry, a size like 17 or 19 needle, which I did once and you don't want to buy those, chances are that there's a pair that you can borrow from the lending library and bring back or not. So the owner is not too precious about the stuff. Um, she just wants to have sort of a resource for folks who like don't want to spend a lot of money like getting into the crafts and like this is a good way to come try it out, see if you like it. And then once you have decided that that's like really like what you want to invest in, then you can buy your own materials or, you know, whatever, or continue to use a lending library, honestly. Um, but one day I went in to chat with um, one of the folks that works there and they let me know that there was a new set of crochet hooks. I thought it was just one and I was really excited about it. It's like, oh no, there's a whole set. Like somebody just brought in like a whole set and like nobody's really going to want those. So if you want them, you should just take them. And I was like, what? I can just take them? And the answer was yes. Yeah. So these were free to me. Free, which has not happened. So I'm really excited. And they are the crochet light crochet hooks. Have y'all heard of these? I've never heard of these before. So I have like a little oh, assortment in various sizes. And what makes them so exciting, they light up. Now I don't know that there's enough light to actually like be useful. Like if you're trying to crochet in the dark or something or like in a movie theater, like I have no idea, I haven't tried them out. I just think the gimmick is really fun. So I took the whole set and I'm like really excited to try to use them. And so anyway, this is this is the first thing I got. I'm just like so tickled that this even exists. I'm like, are there like light up knitting needles? I haven't actually Googled to see, but I just think this is so fun. So crochet light set of crochet hooks, very excited. Now I also re-upped and I apologize in advance for the crackling. I don't want to take them out of the bag because I will lose them and I don't have a good storage spot for them because I've now purchased too many stitch stoppers. But I went back to good old Fox and Pine and I ordered more stitch stoppers. Why? Because I love them and it's fun to match them to my projects and to my bags. And so I just got some more. So let me start off by showing you the food ones that I got. So I got these little mini Oreos. Ooh, that's gonna be, you know what? I'm gonna have to take these out, aren't I? That's okay. I want you to be able to see them in all their glory. I apologize. There's, there's going to be so much crackling in this segment. I just, you know what? Let me just get them all out now. <laughs> and then you can have a minute of not listening to crackling before I start rustling something else. Come on. Okay, great. All right, we're done. Okay, so I got these little Oreo cookies. So, um, I love Oreos. They're probably my favorite, like, is snack cookie like a weird thing to say? Because they're like the cookie that you just eat a lot of because they're kind of like perfectly made. Minor Oreos. I don't dunk them. I don't do the twist off. I just, I just bite into them. So I had to have these because it's part of my identity. <laughs> my cookie identity. But I also love a cone, love an ice cream cone. So I also got some ice cream cone stitch stoppers, which they're so cute. I don't really like sprinkles, if I'm being honest, but that's okay. That's okay because these are fake. <laughs> they're not real cones. Um, so I love these. They're really cute and bright. And then I thought I've got some foxes, but they're orange foxes. And I was like, oh, there's blue 
I got some blue foxes. Look how cute are they? So cute. They look mischievous, but they're cute. So I've got some blue foxes. And then the piece de resistance is being from Wisconsin and repping my state hard no matter where I am in the world. Even if it's embarrassing to other people how much I'm into being from Wisconsin and how much I love cows and dairy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I got, I got the cow stitch markers, folks. I got them. Adorable. Cannot wait to put these on something. So those are my stitch toppers. And then I thought, you know, let's just elevate a little bit. Those are cute and I love them and they're very much my personality, but sometimes I do want to be a little bit fancier. Just, just, a, just a smidge. It depends on my mood. Sometimes I'm really silly. Sometimes I, you know, I need the luxury. So one of the things that I got, which I saw it and I immediately was like, wow, what's that? Is this. It is a row counter and it is by Twill and Print. So I'm not going to take this out of the bag because it'll be a lot of rustling, but you can see it's a bunch of flowers and a tiny little bee. And so when I, when I saw it and I asked what it was, the owner at Fiddlesticks was like, you know, I had you in mind when I ordered that. And I was like, you had me in mind correctly because I will be taking one of these. Thank you very much. And so I did. So I picked that up. Haven't used it. Not sure I'm even going to use it. But the thing that is really cool about it is that it's a pin and a row counter. So you can kind of stick this on the bag that you're using if it requires a lot of row counting and use it that way. So very exciting. But let's talk a little bit about crochet and hooks. So when I first started to crochet many, many years ago, I couldn't even tell you what kind of hook I was using because I feel like there weren't that many types of hooks at Joann's, Michael's, Ben Franklin, whatever. Um, when I started back, I was very confused about which hooks to buy because it was like, there's so many different varieties and materials and I brands and I'm like, I have no idea. So I got a bunch of different kinds all in the same size because I was basically crocheting stuff that all required like an H hook. And so I thought, well, this will be kind of like, so I, I have a friend and my friend used to rate restaurants based on how good they could make a basic American breakfast. So eggs and toast, I think is like all he would order. I can't do that, but I get it. So it's like you then can compare like a base thing across all these different places and sort of decide which one's your favorite. And then presumably other more complicated things will be really good there. That's, that was sort of his philosophy. And honestly, like it worked for him. So I kind of tried to apply that to my crochet hook. So I was like, if I get a bunch of different brands and materials in the same size hook, maybe one of them will reveal itself as like the preferred brand. And then I'll just use those from now on. So I got wood ones that have the thin handles. I got wood ones that have the like big ball handle. Um, I got metal ones that had no padding. I got metal ones that had sort of that like, um, like plastic padding. Um, I tried all of them and like they were all relatively fine, but I did notice I developed a lot of hand problems when I first came back to, to crocheting. And that had a lot to do with how I was holding my hook. So. You can hold it, there's like a knife hold, which I think is like where you're kind of holding it like this. Actually, I'm gonna just use one of my crochet, like crochet hooks to demonstrate. So there's like this, and then you're kind of like doing the motion more like this, which gives you, I think, a lot more leverage. But I find that I had less like motor skills control doing it this way, but this is how I came back because I couldn't remember how I used to crochet. So I just sort of made up something and I was like, this feels really awkward and like, it's hurting my whole like side, my shoulder, my arms, my forearms, my wrist, like everything was hurting. So then I watched a couple of videos on the pen hold and I was like, that looks closer to what I used to do. I think that's the hold. And that is when you hold it like this. So I now crochet kind of more like this, which to me is like, gives me more control, but on a heavier piece, it's also kind of weird. So the type of hook that you get might depend really on like how you hold your hook, but eventually, because of the pain, I ended up going to a video by a company and watching how to strengthen and stretch my hands. That company was Furls. The guy showing the the exercises was like this like really young, like attractive, like European guy. And I was like, am I on the right video? I was like so confused. Um, it was really weird actually, like the disconnect. I was just like, I don't know what's going on right now. 
And it turns out he's the CEO of the company, which now makes total sense. But like he wasn't crocheting and he was just sort of showing these stretches. And I was like, what a weird part of the internet I have found myself on. And I didn't know what furls was because I wasn't really a crocheter. So long story short, after I got better and changed my, I did the exercises for like a week and then I changed my crochet hook to um, one with the like the plastic padding and it just, it fixed it. So like, I was like thankful to this company for like these exercises and I thought I'll just go buy one of their crochet hooks as like kind of a like monetary thank you because like without these exercises, I might not actually be able to be working on my crochet project. Um, and then I got to the website and I was like, oh, these are expensive. All the ones I had been buying were like under $8 and this one was $24 and I was like plus shipping. It's like, ooh, how much am I thankful? And then I was like, you know what though? I committed to it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to get one. And then I can say I got it and it's fine. And the one that I wanted, they were sold out of the H, I think. Either they were sold out of the H or I had decided that I had enough H's and maybe I just was like, just get one size bigger just for variety. Um, so I did get one of their hooks and I used it for my pillow. And now I don't want to use anything else, but I know that that's not practical because they're $24 a hook. But I did treat myself because it had been a very stressful first quarter. And I thought, you know what? I deserve some new crochet hooks. I'm going to order them. So I got these two hooks. They're from their Galaxy collection, I think. Or, well, so it's, I'm confused. So there's a Galaxy collection, which I actually think might just be this one and, and some other designs. So this is my very first hook, which is an eye hook, size eye. But then I think there's also the hor like horoscope or I forget. So now like I've forgotten like the name of them. They're like very specific names, but this one I know is Capricorn. And I feel like this one might be Aries. I don't know. Neither of these is my sign. The sign I am is Sagittarius and they have been sold out of that thing for a hot second. And I'm just like, I almost bought it when it came out. But again, the price point being what it is, I'm like, I can't just randomly buy a $24 hook unless I'm gonna use it for something because I don't crochet that much. So I tried to go through when, when these colors came out, I thought, okay, well, let me, go through my projects, see if there's anything where I need something bigger than an eye, because I have a set of Knit Picks crochet hooks from like a small to an H or maybe even an I. Um, and I thought, I don't really need more crochet hooks, really. So I went through, I found a couple of sweaters. They called for J and K, so J and K. But if those Sagittarius ones come back, I don't even care. I'm buying them because they are purple and gold glitter. And I'm just like, first of all, that is my sign. And second of all, it's purple. So, so these are my extra ones. So just, they're very fancy, but honestly, they're so nice to crochet with. And I think it's because I'm a pen holder. So I don't know how they would feel if I was a knife holder, but it also has like a pretty good grip in the hands. I, I don't know, like I'm surprised that I don't hear more people talking about these. Not that I don't hear people because I definitely do, but when I see people crocheting like in reels and whatever else, like I don't see them pop up very often. I don't know, maybe it's the price because they are very expensive. Um, because they're very expensive, I also splurged for this mango, mango wood holder. And the reason is because the sides are tall and they prevent the hooks from rolling around. So what I discovered is because of the unusual shape, I would put the hook down and it would just roll off onto the floor. Now that's okay in my apartment, like in my bedroom or my living room because there is padding, like there's a carpet or there's a rug or something that they can roll off onto. But I was knitting in public and they were like falling off onto the concrete. And I was like, ooh, not for this price, uh-uh. So I got the holder. This is, when I tell you this is a luxury brand, I cannot stress that enough. Like it's, these are not necessary. And honestly, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's, it's kind of absurd. I'm not gonna, I, I think the Sagittarius and the Cru Cruella de Vil might be the last ones I buy because I, it's just, they're so expensive. And if I was a crocheter who kind of did a little bit of knitting, maybe, but I'm a knitter who kind of does a little bit of crochet. And so I can't really keep 
buying all these hooks like it's just it's just starting to get and feel wasteful and kind of silly but they're beautiful hooks the holder is amazing it feels really soft it's pretty it's it's you know lustrous um so if you can and you want to treat yourself and you're a crocheter i highly recommend these crochet hooks because they're just every time i pull them out to work on a project it's like my whole body lights up like i'm just like oh it's so pretty these materials are so pretty um so there's that okay I also got two books. So I want to preface this by saying that if you are Francophone, um, I want recommendations for podcasters, um, blogs, really anything craft related because I speak French and on a good day I'm fluent, but when I learned French, I wasn't as much of a crafter as I am now. I did knit, so I knew a couple of words, um, really just like literally a couple of words related to knitting. Um, and so when I was in Montreal in December, I realized like I don't have a vocab for like any of the stuff that I do right now. Like I don't know how to do or say, I should say, I don't know how to say anything about these things that I spend all this time on. So I was like, that's not, that's not a great feeling. Like I'm, I'm speaking to people and like very comfortable. And then I get to like a yarn store and I'm like, uh <laughs> so i'm just like should work on that especially if i'm planning to go back which i am um and if i'm planning to retire in some kind of french speaking place which i hope to do um i want to have a command of quilting terms knitting terms crochet terms in french so if you have any of that information or knowledge let me know but i'm also a problem solver so in my mind i thought okay i don't have this vocab but how can i get it so I did start following a few folks on Instagram. Um, so I was really excited about that. But then I also thought, what if I got teach yourself to knit books, which I don't need because I do know how to knit, but in French, in French. So the first book I picked up was Apprendre le Tricot. So it is 10 lessons of very basic, very basic projects and instructions. And it's all in French. It's all in French. So will I make any of these things? I doubt it. I doubt it. I might find one or two things in here that I want to make, but really what I'm going to be doing, actually I lied. I am going to make this. It's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really what I want to be doing is I want to read through this and I just want to like absorb the vocab because I was trying to talk to um, a French Instagrammer about a project that she was making and I was trying to explain my my like knitting technique of like pointer finger for the pearls, middle finger for the knits. And I was like, what is a pearl stitch in French? And then I was like, I have no idea. I have no idea. This will probably fix that. So I'm really excited to read this. Um, I love that there are like kind of these simple books out here that I can pick up that, you know, aren't super expensive and will help me basically like build my craft vocabulary in another language so I picked this up but not to be uh not to be minimalist because who's that um I also picked up a book on sashiko which is a type of embroidery from Japan and I've seen it before I've heard of it my quilt store that I used to live by way on the west side that I don't go to anymore um had a sashiko class I think for a hot minute that I didn't take um but I thought what if I also learned this Japanese embroidery technique in French because I don't know any embroidery terms in French either. So I picked up this book, which is Li Ito Mesashi. I don't know if that is how you pronounce it at all because it's like Japanese, but in French, so no clue. Um, but this is another craft book and it's basically showing you how to create your own textiles. That's To me, that is what Sashiko feels like which is you're taking a piece of fabric and you're creating a textile with embroidery floss. I just love the texture that you get by using this technique. So it's in French, which means that I might have some false starts as I try to understand like what's going on because I don't know the technique at all, but I'm really excited to, to grab some fabric and some thread and really just, like try to make a couple of pieces of fabric and then like maybe like a little notions bag or um, something else as I kind of get my feet wet. So really excited, really, really excited. So those are my two books. And finally, we are on to the yarn. So I am so sorry for the length of this video because 
don't take time off. I got it. It's in, it's in my brain. It's in my brain because that just means that you then have a three hour pause. It won't be three hours. Please don't leave. <laughs> please don't leave. Um, but it might be too, because I have a lot of acquisitions and I also have some stuff to show you for things I'm planning to make, which, so let's do this quickly. Okay. So first off, um, I watch, I don't know how many British YouTubers, so many, so, so many. And one of the things that has been a constant since I started watching folks back in June of last year is this woolly knit craze. Like everybody loves woolly knit. I don't understand it because I don't have it. Um, but the people that I watch are amazing knitters. So I was like, there has to be something about this yarn that I, that I, I have to have it. I have to try it just to have the experience, um, that everybody else is having. So it was definitely FOMO and I was like, I, I want it. So, um, I bought four cones. There was a sale going on. I don't remember the YouTuber's name, but, um, she's very famous. So I should really remember her name, but she was doing a, a cowl. And as part of the cowl, Wooly Knit offered like a 20 or 25% discount on their cones. And so I immediately was like, I can't join the cowl because I can't, finish in time. Like I knew I wasn't going to be like with all these whips, knew I wasn't going to be able to finish in time, but I did want to at least get the yarn so that I could slowly participate after the fact. Um, so I picked up four, four cones, um, which is a lot. And the shipping was very expensive. So I don't know what's happening in the UK with the shipping. I feel like there was a sweet spot in the fall where shipping was like super cheap. And now it's very expensive. So I don't know if this is just like something that happened with Royal Mail. Um, it sounds like they've increased the prices, but like it's much more expensive to order things from the UK now. So I got to calm it down. <laughs> I got I to gotta stop ordering stuff from Wool Warehouse and uh, yeah, Wooly Knit because this was a lot of money. But the yarns. So this is the first cone that I got. So this is Fandango Pink. I also, to make with it, so I just want to shamelessly, I'm stealing this color combination from Amy Palco. I was going to pretend like that's not true, but why? I just, I'm stealing it from her. So I picked up <clears throat> Sunburst Yellow. So for those of you who watch The Meaningful Stitch, which is Amy Palco's podcast, she made a half and half triangle wrap last year. I don't remember. There, there are several of them. So I forget which one. I want to say it was her very first one. Um, and it was sort of a pink and yellow or a coral and yellow combination. And I thought, ooh, I wear a lot of those colors in the summer. I would love to have some kind of shawl for like the evenings when it's like cool and breezy. Um, so I saw these two colors and I thought, well, those, those go together perfectly. So um, I'm also just a very bold personality. So bold colors, I think that's that suits me. So I picked up these two, but also <laughs> as I was scrolling, I was like, oh, what's that orange? I don't really wear a ton of orange, not really, but I couldn't not get this. So this is the Lava Neon Orange, which accurate, like it's like, look how these are glowing. Isn't that wild? So these were my three colors. And then I was like, well, I've got three, but like, is three enough? Maybe I need a fourth one just in case. So my thought process was, I want to get yarns that sort of work with each other. Now, I don't know about this. I think this actually could still work together. It's not quite my vibe, but it could be. I don't hate it. And these obviously work together. But if you might remember from what I just showed you from my crochet blanket, these are these colors. And part of me was like, but I bought these first. So the, uh, it wasn't subconscious but I don't know if I would put these together in light of what's happening with that blanket. So, eh. but luckily I picked up a fourth cone. This is Humbug Black. And let me tell you, that with the orange, oh yes. That with the yellow, oh, I did this backwards. That with the orange, that with the yellow, even that with the pink. So I have innumerable options for these cones, for sweaters, for shawls, for whatever. I need some kind of fingering weight for, and I am over the moon. So it was expensive. It hurt. It hurt. I'm not going to lie. It was a lot, but 
I have so much yarn now and it all coordinates, which means that I don't have to find other yarn to use with it when I wanna make something. So I'm very happy. Um, I will let y'all know how it goes with the Wooly Knit-a-thon. <laughs> that will probably be happening later this year. Um, and yeah, so other yarns that I picked up. So I mentioned very briefly when I was showing you my Joke Beige Pearl, uh, Pearl Soho, my Joke Beige Soho Top by Kadri, that I had also picked up some other colors that were more me. So I got three skeins of the Cascade Hampton in this color, which is... I think they only do numbers, so I'm not even sure it matters. It's color 24. I mean, it's a lavender, some type of lavender. So I just, it's so pretty. So I have three skeins of that for some type of summer shirt. And then I also got three skeins of turquoise. <laughs> and this is the color 3735. Um, it rolls off the tongue. So this is the Cascade Ultra Pima Cotton which is not exactly the same, but it's close enough. So I have that as well. And then if you saw my Instagram, you will know that we had for local yarn shop day, um, I popped in to grab some Pax Fibers, um, their new summer colors. So I got an After the Wild Crocodile, which is sort of like a minty green. And I also got Forest Bathing is darker so in my mind I feel like I want to make a pair of polka dot socks um Summerly Knits has ha, was having like a giant sale and I bought a bunch of her sock patterns and there's a polka dot pattern I thought this might be like just contrasty enough to like make those polka dot socks but have them kind of be like two-toned so that might be what's going on here so Pax Fiber sock in After a While Crocodile and Forest Bathing but also, <laughs> um, y'all know how I feel about Rios. I won't take everything out of the bag, but I, at one point when I went to Fiddlesticks, they had uh, this yarn and it, Rios is sometimes at a premium. So I just bought it all. So this is the Archangel colorway in Malabrigo Rios. And look at this. I don't know what I'm making with this. I'm not even going to pretend. I have no clue. But I have, I think, five skeins. So some have a sweater. Some kind of sweater. Don't know. To, to be determined. But uh, it's Rios. So I'll love it regardless of what I make with it, which is really uh, the best gift to myself is yarn that just always works. So love the color. But Malabrigo also has a yarn that I use for the Sophie scarf um, in a color that I somehow missed the first time. And this color <clears throat> is so moody and broody, but still purple. We know how I feel about purple, even though I didn't know until I started this podcast, in Plume Agate. So this is Plume Agate, the Malabrigo Susuro. I don't think I even really need to say anything about this. I will tell you what the yarn is though. So this is Mulberry Silk, 50% Mulberry Silk, 25% Merino, and 25% Linen. I don't remember what I'm making with this. <laughs> I did have a plan. I don't know what the plan is, but because of the composition, it feels like it wants to be a summer top, spring, summer. So I will dig through its DK sport, DK weight. Um, so I feel like I'm gonna be able to find something in my queue that will work for this weight and for this yardage. So each of these skeins is 325 yards. So I have a little under a thousand yards, which feels like enough to make something pretty substantial. So I'm very excited to have this. I love this color. I don't even, it's just, I don't know how I missed it. I don't know how I missed it, but I didn't miss it the last time and I bought their last three skeins, so. And that was, I think that was at the Sows here. Yes, so mostly I try to shop locally. So I, I don't do a lot of online shopping these days or I try not to. Um, but, uh, there is one company or one one shop, I should say, that was a local yarn store to me when I lived in Brooklyn and it is no longer. But they seem to, I don't know if they 
have me set for like a keyword or like, it feels like whenever Ching Fiber like has new stuff, I get an email from them. I don't get emails any other time. Like literally nothing. I think I moved from Brooklyn and in the entire first year I was gone, I got zero emails from them. The minute Ching Fiber dropped, like new melted baby Surrey, I got an email from them and was like, oh. So I bought a bunch of it because I was like, oh, nobody here sells this. Turns out that's not true. The sow's ear also sells Ching Fiber. D did not know that because I don't know, whatever. Um, but two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whenever it was, I got another email that was like, we have new colors. And I was like, why are you like this? Argyle, hmm? Argyle Yarn Shop in Brooklyn. It is a great shop. Please, please go to them if you're in Brooklyn. They're fantastic. But like, what's up with these emails, y'all? Like, come on, <laughs> like, come on. So one of the new colors that they launched, I think, is called Harajuku. Um, so they had this color before, I believe, in the Melted Baby Surrey. I don't know if I'm getting this confused. I might, this is all vibes, so I might be wrong. But I think they had it in the Melted Baby Surrey, but they didn't have it in the Yak Singles. So the Yak Singles was what caught my eye because let me show it to you in the Melted Baby Surrey. So that's what it looks like. I mean, the, if, the, if this isn't me in a skein, Ah, love it. So have this. And then if we look at the Yak singles, do you see how all those colors, the purple, the hot pink, the hot red, it's all in there. But because Yak has like a gray base, it's muted. I don't know if you can hear the pitter patter. It's raining outside, which is kind of fun. So let me show you them side by side. See that? Like, how cool is that? So in a, in a fit of delusion, I thought I'll get the Harajuku in the Melted Baby Surrey and in the Yak Singles, and I'll make a shawl that uses. And I was just like, it arrived. And I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, why? Sorry, I've got more Katie. I don't know how is she like, I haven't touched that shawl in an hour and a half. Um, I don't know why I was thinking that that would be a good idea because yes, it's cool that they are like complimentary, but I don't know that like it would be visible enough in a shawl. It would be too busy. So that is not what I'm going to do, but I did buy two skeins of the Yak Singles. And so my thought was, what if, yeah, there's 525 yards in this skein. So that is like a thousand, what is that? 1050? 1,050 yards. Yeah. So that is plenty for a top. So it's going to become a top. I'm not sure how I'm going to sort it. I feel like I'm going to have to do some helical knitting to like kind of blend the colors together, but I don't want the blending to like model or like mellow it too much. So I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with this, but I'm very excited about how this like died up on the yak singles. And I'm just really excited to find a project that will do these justice because it's just such beautiful yarn. It feels amazing. I know it's going to have a great drape. Um, so looking forward to using these. But I also picked up a skein of the Melted Baby Surrey in Juniper. In Juniper. So it's a very sort of mossy, back to that mossy boggy feel, which apparently is my inner British trying to, trying to escape. So it's me in these colors. It's either like hot pinks or it's like the bog. Um, but I bought this because I, and I have to preface this by saying, I don't remember what the projects were going to be. This is a common theme where I buy yarn and I'm like, what was I doing with that? I don't know. It'll, it'll get used in the next 30 years. But what I did remember is that when I did an inventory of the Ching fiber that I bought the first time Argyle messaged me. There wasn't, I bought one skein of each color, which I don't know what I was thinking. I think I wanted a variety, but then I was like, what am I supposed to do with one skein? I can't do anything with that. So I don't think that's actually true, but that was where my mind was at was like, I can't do anything with one skein of this yarn. So like, this was sort of a waste of a purchase, but then I took them all out the other day and I really looked at them hard and I thought, what if I make some kind of fade? What if I make a fade? So it's not perfect. 
things never are. But I kind of like how this would go. It's kind of hard to see because they're in the bag and I'm so sorry for the crunching. These are the like loudest labels of all time, but it kind of will work, I think. So that's sort of what we're doing. And I don't know what project is. <laughs> so um, I might hold it with a strand of something and then make like a cardigan that has sort of like a lot of color movement to it. That seems like it would be really fun, but I don't know. And then that one skein of the Har Harajuku in its own little fade. Let's see if I can, how did I have this last time? Ooh. It's gonna look like this or something like that. I took pictures that I wouldn't have to like brain this hard to remember like what order they went in. So I'm, thanks old me. Um, but these colors are obviously incredibly bright and, and neon <laughs> and great. And so I also was thinking about some type of cardigan that might work with this assortment of colors, which I think would be really cool. Again, holding either white or black so that it really like makes the colors like, um, probably white, which is unusual for me. I, I'm not generally a white cardigan. I'm not a white knitwear or anything wear, as you know, but especially not a cardigan because I like to be able to throw that over and I wear mostly black and gray. But you know what? New leaf, turn over new leaf. Now, those are all my acquisitions unrelated to projects. I do have a couple of things that I purchased for future projects, and I wanted to share this to you very quickly. Um, so first of all, I'm going to show you the project that I'm terrified of because I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, I'm going to show you the pattern so that you understand why I would subject myself to, to this pattern. I apologize that my screen is not... Hold on. Let's see if we can get rid of some of this glare a little bit. Let's see. Okay, so this is the Khaled shirt by Jessica Tsung. So that is the shirt. And then if I, let's see, if I click this picture, that gives you a little bit more idea of the shape. So I saw this pattern come across my Instagram feed. I immediately bought it. I immediately went to my local yarn store and was like, what do you have? And we found some, some options that are very me. Um, so specifically, I wanted it to be black. And I wanted it to be black because as a summer shirt, I thought that that would be more wearable than some other colors because I wanted it to be able to kind of coordinate with some of the things that I'm wearing. In hindsight, I don't have enough bottoms so it really probably could have been any color because I'm gonna have to make most of my lower lower body clothing. But I decided to use Malabrigo Silpaca. Now, uh, if you are aware of that yarn, you know it's a lace weight. That whole shirt is made with lace weight yarn on like a, a needle that or a hook you can barely see. Now, I said earlier, I don't really crochet. That is that is accurate. I have made a pillow and I've made a couple of washcloths and I've made, you know, I'm making this blanket and like I've made some granny squares, but like I've never made a piece of clothing. And when I tell you that the spice level on this shirt is like death, it's bad. <laughs> like, and not because of the pattern. Like this is not an indictment of the of the pattern or the designer. It is a gorgeous shirt and she has been wonderful. Like I've messaged her a couple of times to be like, what? What does this mean? It's like basic crochet knowledge that I just don't have because I don't make garments. And so she's been very generous and helpful. And I warned her that I would be back in her mentions like in a couple months when I was confused again. And she's like, I'll be here. So nothing about her at all. She has been fantastic. However, Perhaps when you only crochet home deck things, your first garment should not be a lace weight project in black. Folks, why do I do these things to myself? I love challenges, but sometimes it borders on self-sabotage if I'm not being, I mean, right? Like, do you do that where you like take on a bunch of stuff knowing you can't do it? or assuming, maybe knowing is too strong because we don't really know what we can't handle. But like, I'm pretty confident that like, I don't have currently the skills to make a lace weight garment in crochet. But you know what? I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> I'm 
going to do it anyway because I want to wear it. And I know zero people who have more crochet skills who could do this. I think that's true. I think I might be the only person in my whole group that is like nutty enough to be like, I'm just going to make this shirt. And people are like, what? And I'm like, I don't, what? So these are the yarns I'm using. So this is going to be the main color. And this is going to be the contrast color, which is sort of for those like like ladders, which you'll see in a second. Um, black and speckles, they're beautiful together. So I've been on my swatch game. I didn't show you the swatches for everything else, but I made swatches for the Soho top. I made a swatch for the park knit sweater vest. I've made swatches for the blanket. I've made, like, I'm just, I'm on my swatch game because I'm tired of getting trolled by folks who are like, did you swatch? And I'm like, what? I did swatch and I even washed and blocked and let the swatch dry. So very proud of myself. However, when it came to this swatch, um, I made it and then I was like, this doesn't look like the shirt at all. So I ripped it out and then I made it again and was like, what? And then I was like, I think these needles are the, I think this hook is too small. I can't actually see what hole I'm supposed to be going in. And that my friends is the bane of my existence when it comes to crochet. I love crocheting. I can never figure out what hole I'm supposed to be in like ever, even when I think I know. And so I decided to make another swatch for this shirt on giant yarn with giant needle or a giant hook. So I use like the peaches and cream cotton and like a size H or I hook. Cause I was just like, I just need to be able to see the hole well enough to understand the mechanics of this shirt. And it worked. <laughs> so I posted on my Instagram forever ago, a side by side of the giant swatch and then the like normal swatch, which is this. Is that the wrong side? Oh, here we go. Well, I don't know. So we have basically rows of double crochet and some other things. And then you have this like elaborate sort of like open work section. And then technically this would continue with like the double crochet, but the swatch has you just do like one row instead of the two. Oops, don't want to kick over the camera. Um, so I got there in the end, but it was really spicy and a struggle. And then I was so terrified of like making, doing the, the cast on for this, that I put this aside and like, y'all, I don't remember what I did, which means that I probably have to redo the swatch and start over. <laughs> but I'm going to do it. Now, the sad thing is that folks who crochet were like, whip whipping this out in like two weeks. And I was like, how? How? I don't know the answer to this. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I, I watched it on Instagram and people were like, this was so great as a test knit. I was like, a test knit? I appreciate that she test knit this because you have to. And I'm thinking I could never volunteer for this because it literally is going to take me like a year. I think that like when you do the initial cast on, is it cast on for crocheting? Nobody knew. Hook on? Anyway. Um, it's like hundreds of chains. And I was like hundreds of chains on like a two millimeter hook or whatever it is. And I was just like, how do you even? So I don't know what's happening here. Um, I wanna wear it, I wanna make it, I'm scared to death. Like when we talk about facing our fears, like I was talking about like trying to like steak something this year and like crochet a sweater. Uh-huh, this is like a level that is like well beyond. that. I would absolutely cut through a sweater right now then cast this on, <laughs> which to me feels almost like maybe this isn't the right project, but I really, 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 really wanna make it. And I feel like if I don't put a time frame on it, I won't be as stressed. So it's still in the running. I'm still gonna cast it on, but it is just like the spiciest thing I've ever made like ever in my entire, in my entire life, sewing, crocheting, knitting, quilting. It's the spiciest thing I've ever made. And I'm just like, I don't know about this. Um, but it's summertime and the balcony is, is nicely outfitted. So I just need some warm days and some bright sun to cast it on 
And then I feel like once I get those first couple of rows of double crochet and I get that first panel of open work, like it might start feeling a little bit more comfortable, but it's just the like mental gymnastics of like the cast on and like knowing how hard it was and just not really wanting to like replicate that. Um, and who knows, I might come back next time and be like, I'm not making it because it just was requiring too much mental energy because it's been a month. I cast on a month ago for my swatch and I have not touched it since, so but we'll see. Don't know. Okay. So there's that. I also am getting ready to start. So I mentioned, I think last time that a friend of mine, um, wanted to do a cal. Well, we wanted to do a cal for the James Watts beads of joy shirt that came out a few months ago, maybe a month and a month and a half, two months ago. Don't know. Um, so we had some swatching issues where like I, my swatch was kind of tiny. She had some swatching issues with like yarn choice and needle size. And so like, I think we're finally like in a good place to start it this week. So I am going to actually cast it on. And I wanted to show you proof that I made a swatch. And like, look at how, like that is such good drape. Like, I love that. So I'm really excited for this to be kind of an early fall top. Cause I think given that the yarn is wool, um, so I'm using Knit Picks Chroma in Go Go Boots and Tiki. Just look how fun are those colors? Like these are summer colors to be sure, but it is super wash wool and nylon. So I don't know. It is very drapey and it might be good at night or like on a unseasonably cool day. So like I'm not counting it out, but it does feel like, especially how fuzzy it is, like it feels like it'll be a warm knit and it's getting ready to, to get like infernally hot here. So I don't know if I can call this a summer make, but it will be nice. Um, I also, oh, actually, you know what? I was gonna show you the pattern so that you could see it. So this is what it looks like. So it's a modular knit. You knit the string of beads and then you attach them as you go along. So like you like pick up, I think on the edges as you go along, I think that's how it works. I read through the pattern a few times and honestly was like, what? I'm glad I'm knitting it with somebody else. So with our with our brains combined, I think we can figure it out, but I just love the kind of kitschiness of it as, as a project. So love that. And then I'm gonna make another Helix top. So here's me and my, my girls. <laughs> It's not a kind of weird picture, but I felt like it really illustrated like how nicely it supported my chest with no bra. Like I was like, this is kind of like strangely a good fit. Um, so I'm going to make another one of these for the summer and I'm doing it as part of the um, summer tops cal that now here's another one. So like once again, I mentioned like, how do you pronounce people's names? Like I'm going to call her H Iris, but I've heard people call her Hiris Makes. So I'm like, her name is Iris H. So like we're this is we're back here again where I'm like I really wish people like had some kind of like little recording for like how to look who they are so, so that I would know. Um, I'm using Premier Bamboo Fair in black. Whoops, what am I doing? There we go in black because I'm still me despite all the things that you've seen today. Like a black bamboo drapey top. In, with cables is like right up my street. So absolutely excited to make this. Um, I this, this yarn was gifted to me by Premier. So I'm testing it out to see if I like it. Um, but it feels really nice. I love bamboo and I love that this is basically um, just like a really easy care garment in, in, the, in my future. So very excited about this. And then the last thing if you're still with me and you're not like comatose at this point, um, is that I'm going to Rhinebeck. So I have some friends um, who live in the Boston area and we have decided to go to Rhinebeck together. So I'm very excited. I hope to see folks there. Um, obviously that means I need to have a Rhinebeck sweater because you know, um, so I have been through the ringer. I picked a pattern. I loved it desperately. And then I discovered that the designer has a really strange policy where if you buy a kit, you get access to past projects, but you have to buy that season's kit, even if you don't want that season's pattern or yarns. And it's like the kits are $300 minimum. And I'm like, so I have to pay you $300 for a pattern. 
because I don't want the kit or the yarn that the $300 is paying for. I just want one pattern that I would probably buy your yarns for because honestly trying to pick all the colors, like 18 colors or something, I'm like to pick all those colors would be so much work for me that I would rather just buy a kit from you, but I don't want this new set. I don't want the new kit. I just want the old kit and then maybe like you to put your yarns together for that pattern. Anyway, she refused to do that. And I was just like, I can't support someone who works like this. Like that's, I get it, do you? But I'm like, I'm trying to give you business that would kind of probably equal the thing you're trying to make me buy. I'm not doing it, I refuse, I'm not gonna do it. So talk to my friends, nobody had access to anything. They didn't have any suggestions or ideas for like how to like pool resources. Like I was just like, I don't know how I'm gonna get this pattern. So we just collectively were just like, that pattern is dead to me. Um, and so it is, so I won't even mention what I was gonna make because you can't get it anyway. So instead, I did a search on Ravelry for color work sweaters and steak because again, that was my goal for the year is to steak something. So I was like, I really want to steak something. Um, and I thought, what better statement than a color work cardigan that is steaked to wear to Rhinebeck? Because it's like, you know. So I settled upon the Moonflower by Martin Story. Can you see that? I hope so. It's very, apologies for the light. So... As you might have figured out by now, I'm pretty absurd and I love challenges. I really do too much. I bite off way more than I can chew. Most of the time I get there though. That's the reality is I set these challenges and it's kind of fun. And then like, I usually stress myself out a little bit, but I get there in the end. And so I'm like, I've got till October to make basically like a coat. So of course, what I did was I immediately drove, I decided on the pattern the next morning at 630 in the morning, I drove to Sousier and was like, okay, I got to find the yarns that I need for this coat because I got to start this like ASAP. I don't have that much time and it's really big. So let me show you the yarns that I got. So the first off, the background yarn, the main color is going to be this. It's like an oatmeal. It's called pearl, but it's, it's sort of more of an OD kind of vibe than a, than a pearl, to be honest. Um, I said before, I don't really, this is not a color that I go to for cardigans or coats, but I think it was necessary so that the other colors could pop. So very excited. This is Juniper Moon. Oh, they really jammed that in there. Juniper Moon Farm Patagonia Organic Merino. And this is the colorway pearl. So this is the main color. Now prepare yourselves because when I show you what the contrast colors are going to be, I don't know the names. I'm not going to spend the time trying to, to find them and, and name them, but it'll be on in my Ravelry. So we have a lovely orange. We have a hot pink because me. Also, it means I can wear my Stephen West twists and turns and like this will coordinate somewhat a little bit with it. We have turquoise, which is reading a little bit more as like a royal, like a kind of a, I don't even know what kind of blue this is. It's not really turquoise, but it's turquoise adjacent. <laughs> We've got a purple because of course. It's kind of like a, almost like a magenta-y purple though. So like more, I would say more magenta than purple because this one is sort of a more traditional purple. And then finally, oh, this is so hard we've got a green to tie it all together. So <laughs> here are my colors for the moonflower. I am <clears throat> over the moon <laughs> to be making this. I'm a little bit scared because I read through the pattern very quickly and like so quickly that I didn't really gather details. I just sort of was like, Okay, yeah, this looks fine, um, which is not really how you want to read a pattern, if I'm being real. You don't want to do that. But it says that there's color work and intarsia. And I was like, what, is, what does that mean? So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is I got to cast this on because uh, if that is true, um, I got to learn how to steak and I got to learn how to do intarsia potentially in the round. So I don't know. I don't know what's happening. So um, that's the moonflower. So that's... If you see me at Rhinebeck, 
this year, I will be wearing that. I'm putting it in the ether on the internet right now. I'm committing to it, even if it means I don't need anything else. If that's the only thing I work on between now and September 15th or whatever it is, um, that is the project. So let me know what you're making for Ryan Beck. If you know, I know a lot of people wait till sort of later in the year and go with like designers who have like their special Ryan Beck sweaters or shawls or like whatever. Um, but I just didn't want the stress of trying to like speed knit something for my first Ryan Beck. So I'm giving myself some time, but I'm really excited to be going and I hope I run into a lot of you. Okay. Oh, also very quick shout out to all of the local folks that I've seen. So I don't remember all of your names. I'm very sorry. I'm terrible with names, like terrible. Um, but I've run into folks at the Sow's Ear and also at Monty's, same same woman. So, hey, I feel like your name's Melissa. But if, I, if it's not Melissa, I'm very sorry. But please tell me your name next time I see you because I'm sure I'll see you again soon. Um, and also over down by Lakeside, I ran into a lovely lady and her baby. So that was really nice. So it's just been like kind of fun to like wander about Madison um, and like run into people. So if you see me, say hi. Oh, and Rosita, my goodness, I completely forgot um, who's a staple at the Sows here. So hopefully next time I'm out in Verona, I will see you again as well. Um, so yeah, it's just been really fun like running into folks and saying hi. Um, and yeah, I apologize again for the two month hiatus roughly and for the absurd length of this video. But if you made it to the very end, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Um, and I didn't mention before, but um, I have a coffee, Ko-Fi shop. If you are feeling generous, you can buy me a chai. Um, I will be opening up memberships next month. So I didn't get to it this month because the delay and I wanted to be consistent. I feel like that has to be consistent. So I wanted to like really pinpoint like a good day that I could commit to every month. So haven't done that yet, but it's coming. Um, and as I mentioned, please subscribe because I don't know when the next video will be and I don't want you to miss it <laughs> because you have to see what I've done with all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I hope you have a wonderful day and happy knitting. Bye.